So how many of you know there's an invisible world that we cannot see? That's just as real as the world that we can touch and feel and sense. It's a spiritual world. And every once in a while we get glimpses of it. When we watch something on the news and you're like, that is pure evil. What that person did to that person, what that group did to that group. There's a source that's beyond just human understanding of what that evil is. And, and, and the Apostle Paul says that that's indication of a spiritual battle that's going on that we can't see. In the book of Ephesians chapter 6, he writes this, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. He says there's a battle behind the battle, that if you can see them, they're not the primary enemy. That there's something going on that sometimes we get a sense of, that was weird, that was Something felt off, something felt different, something, something is moving that person in this direction, and I don't know exactly what it is, and, and today Jesus is going to lean right into these things because he's going to talk about how demons are at work in the world. He's going to talk about Satan, the enemy of our soul, the one who comes to kill and steal and destroy. He's going to talk about judgment day. He's going to talk about all these things that weren't a lot like last week. Last week, Jesus is talking about rest and Sabbath and watching the birds and feeling peace. And there's beautiful moments where the, the, the service we lean in, we're like, I want to live in that rest. And then there's moments like this that right after Jesus says, hey, there's some hard things I want to talk to you about. And and we want to be wise to lean in that evil is real and that the devil is real and that judgment is real. And this is how Jesus begins in Matthew chapter 12, verse 22. So then they brought to Jesus a demon-possessed man who was blind and mute. And Jesus healed him so that he could both talk and see. And all the people were astonished and said, could this be the son of David? Now this idea of the son of David means, is this the Messiah? Because we just witnessed a miracle. A guy who could not speak and could not see, now he can speak and now he can see, and everyone is saying something miraculous happened, but the religious leaders, they have their own explanation for how it happened. Look at the next verse, verse 24. But when the Pharisees heard this, they said, it's only by Beelzebul, the prince of demons, that this fellow drives out demons. And Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them, every kingdom divided against itself will be ruined. And every city or household divided against itself will not stand. And if Satan drives out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then can his kingdom stand? And if I drive out demons by Beelzebul, by whom do your people drive them out? So then they will be your judges. But if it is by the Spirit of God that I drive out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Or again, how can anyone enter a strong man's house and carry off his possessions unless he first ties up the strong man? Then he can plunder his house. Whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. All right, this is one of those scenes where, you know, it'd be great to follow Jesus around just for a day and experience all the amazing out-of-control moments that happen and see how he responds and people how, see how people respond. And this is one of those moments. He heals this guy. Everyone says this is like a legit miracle, but everyone has their own explanation. And the religious leaders are like this. If I can't understand it, then it's not real. If I can't fully grasp it, then I've got to figure out a way to explain it away or explain it in my own way. And, and, and we as the people of God don't want to be this way as, as we're going to talk about or watch Jesus talk about all these difficult things. Um, we, we want to lean in. And so Jesus says, you know, your explanation that I cast out demons by Beelzebub, by the the prince of demons. That makes no logical sense. How can a kingdom survive if it's divided? A house divided cannot stand. That was not Abraham Lincoln's line originally. He he borrowed that from Jesus. A house divided cannot stand. He's saying, I'm not driving these demons out by the prince of demons. He says, but if I drive them out by the spirit of God, then you know the kingdom of heaven has come near. This is his explanation for what's happening. But we need to back up just for a second because if you're new to the Bible or new to Christianity, you gotta go, okay, Doug, let me just ask you this question. Do you really believe like in the devil, like the red suit, the little horns, the pitchfork? No, I don't believe in that devil. 
But I do believe in a literal enemy for your soul. He's the source of, of evil. And, and the Bible gives this explanation for how Satan came to be. And Jesus is gonna go into this a little more in this passage. But I wanna go with, with you just for a moment to Isaiah chapter 14. Here's what the Bible describes Satan's fall. How you have fallen from heaven, morning star, son of the dawn. You've been cast down to the earth, you who once laid low the nations. You said in your heart, I will ascend to the heavens. I will raise my throne above the stars. I will sit enthroned on the Mount Assembly. Satan was a created angel. Ezekiel chapter 20, it says he was the chief cherub. He was the worship leader in heaven. He was, he was beautiful. He was gifted. He was charismatic. And he started to wonder after a while, why, why does God get the seat up there? Why can't I sit in his seat? Why don't they sing songs about me? And through whatever act of persuasion, he was able to get a host of other angels to follow him. The book of Revelation describes it this way. Then a war broke out in heaven, and Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon, his angels fought back. But he was not strong enough, and they lost their place in heaven. And the great dragon was hurled down, the ancient serpent called the devil, or Satan, who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth, and his angels with him. This is sort of the backdrop of many of the verses that describe the whole story of all creation, that, that, that Satan was this gifted and talented angel that pride crept into his heart, that he tried to stage a coup in heaven and that he failed because he is a created being. And you know, you say this, never bring a knife to a gunfight. Uh, God's always gonna win in a battle because he's the one who's all creator. He's all powerful. He's almighty. Our God can never lose, right? And so... These angels, a third of heaven is cast down, and these angels are what we now know as demons, a fallen group of spiritual beings whose job is to work, to kill, and steal, and to destroy. At the end of Revelation chapter 12, it says Satan left this battle in rage because he could not get to God, and so he went to war against those who had God's heart, those who God loves. That's you. That's me. And that's why we see, again, so many things, uh, so many moments of evil and brokenness and strongholds in the world, and Jesus is going to take these things head on. And so we see this moment where he says, hey, you want to know the kingdom of God has come near? By the Spirit of God, I'm casting out demons. I'm freeing people from these strongholds in their life and bringing them deliverance. And if, if you look with me at verse 29, he, he calls Satan the strong man. He says when, when, when Satan has possession of someone's mind or someone's heart and control of their impulses, it's like he's the strong man in the house because if someone can bind the strong man, then he can clean the house. He can plunder the house. That's what it says. So here's what Jesus is saying. Jesus is sort of talking trash to the devil. He's the strong man. I'm stronger and I'm gonna tie him up, and I'm gonna plunder his house, and I'm gonna bring one person at a time into freedom from bondage, into freedom from bondage. Have you ever gone from freedom to bondage that Jesus has done in your life? You start to see like, I'm one of the people that was a pawn of, of evil, a pawn of the enemy. I was bound by things, something stronger than me, and Jesus came and bound the strong man and freed me, because when the sun sets you free, you are free indeed, right, church? This is what we celebrate as Christians, the freedom that we have in the gospel. And then in verse 31, Jesus is going to change topics, and he's going to change a lot of topics in this, in this really brief narrative, and he's going to talk about a sin that sort of has a lot of people puzzled, a sin called the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Verse 31, and so I tell you, Jesus says, every kind of sin and slander can be forgiven, but blasphemy against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. Anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but anyone who speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven either in this age or in the age to come. And now some of you are getting worried like, oh man, did I do that? Did I commit that sin? Because if I can't be forgiven, I'm in big, big trouble. Now, here, here's what this is not. This is not uh, you saying something to God in your moment of anger are you blaspheming God or saying something in, in this kind of moment of, of rage against God that you can never be forgiven? Now, Paul, the great apostle of the Christian faith, says in 1 Timothy 1, I was once a blasphemer. I was once a persecutor of God's people. I was once a violent man because I was ignorant and I was an unbelief. But by the grace of God, he saved me. And now he's used me for his purposes. So listen, when you think about the sins that you've committed 
And you think, man, I don't know, I've, I've committed so many sins or so many of those bad sins or these are the sins I don't think you can be forgiven for. There is not a single sin in your life that cannot be forgiven by the grace of God because as deep as it is, his grace goes deeper, right? And so the context is what is the, the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit then and, and, and have I committed? You know, the context is that these religious leaders have seen a legitimate miracle that God has done. And because it doesn't fit in their box, they decide to call it evil. And it's this stubborn unbelief. It's this bind that says, even if it is true, and even if God is real, I am determined and willfully choosing not to believe, not to submit, and not to give my life to him. This is a condition of the heart. It's a, I've made up my mind. No matter what the Bible says, no matter what I've experienced in life, it's not for me, or it's not real, or it's sourced in some evil force. It's that set mindset. And so the Spirit of God, his role in our life is to bring conviction and to draw us into the truth and to remind us that we have power over sin and to remind us who we are in our identity. And if your whole life you do this, then you will choose not to be forgiven. And Jesus says, be very careful. And remember, he's speaking to very religious people who understand uh, who God is. Now in verse 33, he's going to take it up a notch. He says, and make a tree good, and its fruit will be good. Or make a tree bad, and its fruit will be bad, for a tree is recognized by its fruit. And now he's going to borrow a word from John the Baptist's cousin. You brood of vipers, how can you who are evil say anything good? For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in him, and an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in him. But I tell you that everyone will have to give an account on the day of judgment for every empty word they have spoken. For by your words you will be acquitted, and by your words you will be condemned. Again, you're reading this and you're like, this is not like last weekend's message. We're talking about rest and joy and peace. And now Jesus switches this topic for this topic. And again, he's not doing this because he's in a bad mood. He's doing this to say, hey, I want you guys to know there is a spiritual world you cannot see. And there are things going on that you are either actively or passively participating in. He, said, he says to the religious leaders, you're actively storing evil in your heart and you don't even realize it. And, and by your words, you will one day be acquitted or condemned. Now again, we, we, we as the people of God, we're like, what does that mean? Does that mean I, I cursed in traffic last Friday? Does that mean on the judgment, God's gonna play that videotape? No. Here's what that means. If you're in Christ, if you're a Christian, here's the words that you're gonna be acquitted by. The Bible says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That by the grace of God, your sins are not gonna be counted against you because you've been forgiven and you've been covered by his righteousness. And that's really good news. Right? You think that's really good news? Like every past, present, and future sin. But if if your words express what's in your heart, which is what Jesus is saying, well, your unbelief is going to come out. Your cynicism is going to come out. Your critical spirit is going to come out. And that thing that comes out is only judging what's already in your heart. Out of your heart, your mouth will speak. And he's pointing to something that the, that the Pharisees have, have developed inside their DNA, this sense of stubborn unbelief, this sense of pride that they know what's right. And Jesus says, because of this pride, because of this self-righteousness, it's actually uh, evil that's taken part into your life. And as you feed that, it grows. And so they become righter and righter and righter, and everyone else becomes wronger and wronger and wronger, and now they feel this sense of spiritual superiority. And it's like, that's, that's actually evil. He calls, he calls the most religious people of his day evil. And there's this moment where there's this sober sense, and he talks about on the day of judgment, those words that sound so good are going to be the words that actually condemn you. And so it's a good question for us, God, what am I storing in my heart? What am I allowing in that space in my heart and my mind, and how is it affecting me? Because whatever you feed grows. Whatever you're putting in your mind, the more you put in the mind, the more that appetite grows, the more you think about it, the more it possesses your mind, the more it, it creates desire towards it. So one of the questions we have to ask ourselves is, what am I feeding my mind? What am I feeding my soul? Because out of the overflow, my mouth will speak. 
And now in verse 38, he's going to talk a little more about judgment. Then some of the Pharisees and teachers of the law said to him, teacher, we want to see a sign from you. Now this is kind of laughable. He just healed a guy who was blind and mute and, and gave an explanation. The explanation was, if you see demons lead by the Spirit of God, you know that the kingdom of heaven has come. And they're like, well, then give us a sign. He's like, what was that? And what were all the signs that were given before? Now, here's what Jesus says. He answered, a wicked and adulterous generation asked for a sign, but none will be given except for the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a huge fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And the men of Nineveh will stand up in judgment with this generation and condemn it. For they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And now something greater than Jonah is here. And the queen of the south will rise at the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For she came from the ends of the earth to listen to Solomon's wisdom. And now something greater than Solomon is here. Well, what's, what's happening here? Well, Jesus is saying, hey, Remember Jonah? Remember that guy, that prophet who didn't want to preach to those pagan people, those Assyrians? I mean, Jonah was the lamest prophet in the Old Testament because he's the one that when God said, go preach to those people, he ran away and God found a way to get him back. And then his, his sermon to the people of Nineveh was, repent, because if you don't, in 40 days, you're all dead. And then he goes and sits on a hill and waits for a fire to come down from heaven to kill all the enemies of God. And the crazy thing is they repent. These pagan people who don't know the God, Jehovah, or the God of the Bible, the God of the Jewish nation, they, they, they come into repentance, and Jonah's mad about it. And Jesus is like, there's a greater prophet than Jonah that's here. And, this, and the way that God got that, that message of repentance was he was in the belly of this fish for three days, and Jesus is like, I'm going to be in the belly of the earth for three days, and that's going to be the sign that I am who I say I am. I'm going to rise from the dead. A greater prophet than Jonah is here. And on the judgment day, the people, the, the wickedest people that maybe the world has ever known are going to stand in judgment over this religious people who are supposed to know better. And then he says, and the queen of Sheba, she heard legends of Solomon's wealth and wisdom, and she traveled hundreds of miles to see was it true. And when she saw it, she said, I haven't, I haven't heard the half of what I actually saw with my eyes. And Jesus says, someone wiser and richer than Solomon is here. That's who I am. And on the day of judgment, this queen who doesn't know the God of Israel is going to stand in judgment on all of these religious people who know better. Now, this idea of judgment has sort of fallen out of vogue, out of fashion. You know, today in the church and today in society, we'll, we'll talk about heaven, but we, we won't talk about hell. We'll talk about God, but we won't talk about Satan. We'll talk about angels. I was touched by an angel. I won't talk about de demons because that all this feels really Weird, but my question is, how do you have good without evil? How do you have God without this enemy? How, how do we understand the battles that go on? How do we understand how to interpret our news? We know there is good and there is evil, and there is a judgment. Uh, people that say, oh, you know, I, I don't believe in judgment. I was like, okay, well, then do you believe Hitler will be in heaven? Oh, no, 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 not him. Well, then where, where, where do you draw the line? Because if there is a line that's going to be drawn, and if justice is going to reign at the end of the day, then good will be declared good and evil will be declared evil and all of us will applaud the righteous judgment of God at the last day. And so the question for us is, well, where will I be on the judgment? And Jesus is causing us to think. Now, if you want to read the end of the story, you can actually go to Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20, toward the end of the chapter, you'll see two sections. One is the judgment of Satan, and the last section you'll see is the judgment of the dead, those who stand before God. I'm not going to read the whole section, but I just want to give you a picture. For those of you who are curious, I don't, I don't know what's going to happen at the end of the age. What's going to happen? Well, we know Satan's origin, his rebellion. We know the fallen angels, and we know that his role on the world now is, how do I take as many people to the judgment with me as possible? But at the end of the day... Revelation chapter 20, verse 10, it says, The devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of burning sulfur, along with the beast and the false prophet, and they were tormented day and night forever and ever. And for us, we're like, good, finally, evil has been vanquished, and the one responsible for all this is paying a price. And there's something that makes us go, okay, finally, justice comes. But then the next verse says, And then I saw a great white throne, and him who was seated on it. And the earth and heavens fled from his presence, and there was no place for them. And then he sees men and women, great and small, stand before God, and the books are open. 
And if your name is written in the book of life, you inherit heaven, eternal life. And if your name is not written in the book of life, then you join Satan and his demons in that place called hell. And now everyone goes, whoa. And the question for a life is, where will I be on the judgment? And how do I get my name in that book? And Jesus says, at this moment of us thinking about not just good and evil, but our eternal destination is gonna be important to us because people far more wicked than us may be in heaven because they've repented of their sins and acknowledged they need a savior. And people that are better than us may also find themselves in hell because they decided to go into heaven and depend on their own righteousness and say, God, I'm gonna get in on my own. The Bible says that God is holy. And if you even had one sinful thought your entire life, your sin separates you from God. And the question is, what do I do with that? And the answer is you go to the only one who can bring forgiveness to you. That's who Jesus is. And his sign is, I'm gonna be in the earth three days and I'm gonna rise again so I can prove to you I am who I said I was. I am the Messiah, the savior of the world, and I've come to save you. This is the gospel. This is the story of Jesus. And so we wanna be sober about that moment and be ready for that moment. Now, the last part of this section, he talks about impure sport, spirits once again. Look at verse 43. Now when an impure spirit comes out of a person, it goes through arid places seeking rest and does not find it. And then it says, I'll return to the house I left. And when it arrives, it finds the house unoccupied and swept and clean and put in order. And then it goes and takes with it seven other spirits more wicked than itself. And they go in and live there. And the final condition of that person is worse than the first. And that is how it will be with this wicked generation. Again, Jesus is saying some very sober words. And he says this idea of these fallen angels, these demonic spirits, they're looking for a house, they're looking for a place. If you remember the story that we read earlier about a man filled with a thousand demons, his name was Legion, and Jesus cast the demons out, and they went into the pigs who went over the cliff and died, and people said, get out of our city, this is too crazy for us. He says, these spirits, they're roaming the earth looking for a place to land, and so if you become the type of person, and we use this phrase all the time, oh, that guy, he had his demons. Oh, that woman, she had her demons. It could be alcohol, it could be drugs, it could be issues of domestic violence, it could be all these sorts of issues in their life. And, and through behavior modification and therapy and medication, they, they found their way to be better and to find a, a process of living a life and coping. And he says, but if you clean the house and don't realize there's spiritual attachments there and spiritual roots there, you might actually be worse off in the end than you were in the beginning. Because every stronghold has a spiritual connection to it. And again, he, he's using this example. He says, this is like this wicked generation. So he's actually talking about the Jewish people. If you think about the Jewish people before Jesus, a few centuries earlier, they were involved in what you call idol worship, worshiping Asherah and worshiping Baal, worshiping the gods of the Babylonians and the Persians and the Philistines. And, and then... They, they found their way back to God. They found their way back to his word. And now during this time, they, they have the Torah. They're, they're trying to walk in righteousness. They're praying, they're fasting, they're trying to do good. And Jesus says, you know, you've gone from all this hedon, hedonism and idolatry and over-sexualization, and that's great, but now you've gone to kind of a sense of self-righteousness and a critical spirit and looking down on people because you feel superior to them because you've done all the right things, but you haven't invited the Spirit of God on the inside. And your condition over here could be worse than it was over there. Again, that should wake us up, because a lot of us, we were, our lives were really jacked up before we met Jesus. We were involved in all kinds of stuff. And we knew we were a wreck. We knew we were disconnected from God. We knew what shame felt like. And then we were introduced to Jesus. And then we started reading the Bible and started doing good things. But if we're not careful, we'll, we'll start to go, oh, look at me. I'm doing pretty good. And why don't all those people do what I do? What's wrong with them? And Jesus says, if we're not careful, this condition can be worse than that condition because there are spiritual connections that we have to recognize because there's an invisible world that we cannot see that is just as real as the world that we can touch and see. And then Jesus' family wants to meet with him. As Jesus is saying all these things that sound crazy to them, his mother and his brothers are knocking on the door to get in. And we know from Mark chapter three in this exact narrative, they have come to take possession of him because they think he has lost his mind. Jesus' brothers are like, our big brother has lost his mind. Even Jesus' own mother thinks something has gone wrong with her son. 
And so they come to ask him to come talk to them. Verse 46. While Jesus was still talking to the crowd, his mother and brother stood outside wanting to speak to him. Someone told him, your mother and brothers are standing outside wanting to speak with you. And he replied, who is my mother and who are my brothers? And pointing to his disciples, he said, here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my father in heaven is my mother and sister and brother. Which is awesome for the people inside the house, but really stinks if you're his family. Like, what? Like, are you really doing that? Now, now here's what Jesus knew. His brothers did not believe in him during his life. His brothers James and Jude only came to faith in him after he appeared to them in his resurrected body, which is a good way to indicate, okay, my brother was the son of God. Okay, he just came back from the dead. Wow. But there, there is a time in your life where maybe your own family doesn't get what happened to you when you met Jesus. They're sort of like... I don't know about you. I mean, that whole religion thing is good for you, but something doesn't make any sense. And, and they don't understand it. And what you find is early in your Christian life, if your family doesn't understand what you've done as you become a Christian, other people who aren't your biological brothers or sisters or mothers or fathers become like family. Anybody ever meet someone that's like family to you because you know this, there's this beautiful relationship as you live in community, as you do life together, like, this is like my brother. This is like my mother. And Jesus says, this is what the family of God is. It's not just a spiritual metaphor to help us understand what it means to be in a Christian family. It's a spiritual reality. As you are connected to God and as you realize we've all been forgiven of our sins and we're all going to heaven. And no matter what language we speak, no matter what country we come from, no matter what religion we grew up in, as we put our faith and trust in Jesus, we become family forever. That's the good news. That's what brings us all here today, together, right, today. We're all from different backgrounds, and there's so many things that make us different from each other, but the one thing that unites us is the most important thing, that we have asked Jesus to change our lives, and that's what it means to be part of the church. And so we fight battles for each other. We watch each other's back. We go through the highs and the lows together. And one of the, the ways we do that is we, we battle together in these stronghold areas of life. So how do we apply some of these, some of these teachings of Jesus in, in 2024? So I want to talk for a minute about strongholds. Because sometimes we grew up in churches where people talk about Satan and demons and the devil. And honestly, it's just really weird. And so you're like, I don't want to be weird. And sometimes we grew up in churches that don't talk about any of that stuff. And we sort of neglect it. But Jesus gives us this very balanced way to see these things. And so we're going to try to get practical as we think about how to apply them. So here's what Paul says about strongholds that happen in our hearts and in our lives. He says, though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. So think about the words that Paul is using. He's saying there are strongholds that can exist in our lives, but we have the power to break those. And those strongholds exist in the mind, the word knowledge, the word argument, the word pretension, the word thoughts. That somehow we can believe things that aren't true. We can embrace ideologies that take us away from what God's plan is. I mean, you, you can even have a friend who's like, yeah, I'm really getting into like the, this spiritual journey. And that could be good or bad based on what spirit you're following. Just because someone's spiritual doesn't mean that spiritual journey is going to be good. It's going to lead them to God. And we have to learn to identify these strongholds in our life. And then learn, how, how do we break them? So I'm going to give you an example of how powerful your brain is, how powerful your mind is. Your mind is more powerful than any AI technology that's ever been created. Your brain has and can remember everything you've ever seen, everything you've ever heard, everything you've ever experienced. And your brain has a way to categorize these things in ways that is subconscious to you. And I'll prove it to you. That's how you can meet someone for 10 seconds and walk away and go, I don't like them. <laughs> because your brain's met 727 people just like that. And three of them bullied you in middle school. And you already connect. That's who they are. I don't like them. I can't trust them. That's what you call a trigger. And your brain doesn't just do this with people. Your brain does this with experiences. You experience stress 
And your brain has a category. When you experience this type of stress, here's what you do. And some people, they ruminate, and they, they, they get stressed out. And then some people go, you know, when I get in that space, my, my head's just going, I, I, need, I need a drink. You know, when I take a drink, it calms me down. You don't even realize that your mind has processed a stressful situation, and then your response to cope with that has become a stronghold habit in your life, and you don't even realize you're doing it. You go to drugs, you go to alcohol, you, you go to pornography, you go to eating food, you go to shopping, you go to the things that, that bring your mind a sense of ease in the moment to get through the moment, and you don't realize that strongholds work on our vulnerabilities. And well, a stronghold is just an area of your life where you're not free, where, where there is not just a behavioral thing going on, but there's also a spiritual string attached to it. And, and for us, it's not just the mind. You see, for us, we, we can sort of understand that our bodies um, are made of three parts. We are body, soul, and spirit. When God made Adam in the garden, Genesis 2, 7, he made and formed him out of dust. That's our body. And then he breathed in him. That's our spirit, the part of us that connects to God. But then Genesis, and Genesis says, and then God made Adam a living soul. What is, what is the soul? You think about, where, where do you find this, the soul on an anatomical chart? Like, what is the soul? Because we use this word a lot. Well, well the Bible describes the soul as, as really having three components to it. The human soul is made up of our mind and our emotions and our will. It's the things we think and the things we feel and the desires that drive us toward responses. And listen, just because your emotions or feelings are real doesn't make them true. Has anyone ever been tricked by their own feelings? You were so sure that person was either bad or good. You were so sure it felt so right or it felt so wrong. And you realize in retrospect, I, I was way off because I didn't have the right perspective. And so sometimes our will drives us towards things that are destructive. Sometimes our mind can paralyze us because it's trying to process what happened before and how do I get out of this? How do I get my needs met? How do I find my way? How do I overcome these feelings that drive or paralyze me? And, and these are areas where we can get stuck. So I'm going to give you some examples. Proverbs chapter 4, or I'm sorry, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 26 and 27 said this. In your anger, do not sin. And don't go to bed angry. And don't give the devil a foothold. Okay, so think about these three things. A anger is a stronghold for a lot of people. And maybe it's a stronghold because well, there's this idea of generational sin. You grew up in a family where your dad or mom expressed anger in a certain ways. And some kind of anger, Ephesians says, is you, you rage you use profanity, you get out of control, you let wrath come, and, and you, you watch your mom or your dad do that. Or you watch someone quietly go to bed angry and stuff it, and there's a sense of bitterness and criticism, and, and you don't even realize you're swimming in this ecosystem as you grew up, and so you start to model this behavior. You synthesize it into your life, and then you wake up and you're 30 years old, and you're like, why am I so angry? Why did I curse that guy in traffic? Why am I holding on to this grudge? And you don't realize those generational habits or sins have been passed on to you. And you, you love Jesus, but you're just wondering where this anger comes from. And Jesus says, pay attention to that because the devil can get a foothold into your soul. And that foothold can turn into a stronghold. And so you can say, Jesus, I know that you love me and I'm forgiven and I'm going to heaven, but I don't know how to get through Tuesday and Wednesday. Because you can be forgiven and not be free. And Jesus is saying something powerful about what it means to be free. He's stronger than the strong man who wants to possess your soul. He's stronger than the thoughts that go through your mind or the feelings that go through your heart. And he wants you to recognize that he can set you free in those areas if you'll allow him to. Maybe you grew up in a, a family where, where sex sort of took its place from this holy thing that's a union between a husband and a wife for life. And now you live in this over-sexualized environment where, where women learn to use their bodies to control people or men approve their manhood, their machismo by their sexual conquest. Maybe you grew up and sexual abuse was part of your upbringing. Now that trauma and that wound sort of informs how you see your sexuality and how it's expressed. And, and you don't know what to do with all that. It's this toxic mix of your thoughts and your feelings and your emotions and your wills and your wounds. And you love God and you praise your, you raise your hand and worship today, but 
If you're really honest, if you're sitting at home all by yourself, you're like, I don't, I don't know what to do with all this. And I wanna say, like, counseling is a part of that journey. Accountability is a part of the journey. Honoring God with your body is a part of that journey. But there is a spiritual string attached to the brokenness that we carry that Jesus wants to bring healing to and freedom to. He says, we can break this stronghold. We have divine power to demolish it because here's, here's God's desire for us. First Thessalonians chapter five. Now may the God of peace make you holy in every way and may your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless until the Lord Jesus comes again. Notice what he says. He doesn't say, hey, live with the pain, suck it up, eventually I'll be back and you'll go to heaven. No, he says, I'm gonna come back, but until I do, I want your body, your soul, and your spirit to be whole, for you to be healed and free. I want you to be blameless. I want you to be holy because you are my vessel, and I want you to be filled with my spirit. And there's, this is God's heart for his people. The enemy has come to kill and steal and destroy, to create these compartments in your life. And Jesus has come to say, now I'm here to bind the strong man. Now I'm here to bring freedom in your name. Now, now there's nothing like a story that can help us illustrate this. It's because we have a lot of people walking around and coming to church and you look great on the outside. You're smiling, you're saying praise the Lord, you're serving. And there was a woman who served in, in this campus, just a hospitality. She probably greeted you as you walked through the door today. And, but she carried a secret, something she wasn't able to say out loud, a stronghold in her life, until one day she had the courage to say it. I want you to watch Gabby's story. For most of my life, I struggled with bulimia and nobody ever knew. Since little, I always heard that I was fat. I was never thin enough. I was never good enough. I wanted to, to fill the void that I felt. Food was always my comfort. And I started dealing with my food addiction during my teenage years. Food addiction is thinking about food 24-7. And it's eating, overeating, and overeating. It doesn't matter how bad I feel, um, I will continue eating. But at the same time, I didn't want to gain weight. So I would just throw up. Depending on the day, I would maybe purge one or twice. And when it was severe, I would, you know, purge maybe 15, 20 times a day. I was tormented. Nobody knew for years that I was struggling with bulimia. I carried that secret my whole life. So my turning point was when I was in a Bible study and I remember the, the Holy Spirit pushing me, say it. He wanted to heal me, but in order to heal me, I needed to confess it. And I remember that's when I said it. The room was silent and I started crying. I was like, wow, I said it. When I, I was able to, to confess it, I was met with love and grace. I felt like the pressure that I had of the whole world, I had in my shoulders, it was gone. And when I confessed it, that's when the healing started. It's not easy to come out and say what you're struggling with because sometimes as a Christian, you feel that you need to have everything together. You want people to see you like you're perfect. You know, you don't struggle with anything. And at the end of the day, we all struggle with something. And that's why we, we need Jesus. He understands what we're going through, all our struggles with all our imperfections, we have the reassurance that doesn't matter what happens, he loves us unconditionally. 
couple of years after I went through my healing, I was able to confess it to my son. And he, too, showed me grace and love. We cannot be free without Jesus. And when you have him, everything changes. I feel free. I am free. That's the power of confession. We all struggle with something. And here's the thing. We don't like to put ourselves out there. So we always do these general confessions. Yeah, I'm struggling with something. Yeah, I know I'm falling short of the glory of God. You know, no one's perfect. I got my stuff. And those general confessions sort of lead to general repentance, which leads to really no surface or no deep change, just a surface level kind of confession. But when you're specific about a confession, I struggle with the sin of bulimia and I want to be free. There's something powerful when the Spirit of God gives you the courage to say something and step into the light. You know, Jesus would say, this, the Son of Man has come into the world, but people love their darkness because their deeds were evil and they covered up. They didn't realize that if they came into the light, they could be forgiven and the shame could be removed and they could be free. I had a guy, a young man, walk up to me last, last night and he said, I have a stronghold of my life and it's a stronghold of victimization. I live as a victim. Because of what happened to me in my past, I sort of say to God, I'm unique. And so I, I disregard his commands in my life and that mindset of living like a victim is robbing me of life. And so I'm here to confess and repent and we pray this prayer that I believe set him free. You know, it's, it takes a lot of courage to say something out loud. And Gabby is like a model for us because not only was she courageous enough to say it out loud, but now she leads in Celebrate Recovery every week as a sponsor, helping people walk through these steps of living free because when God sets you free in that way, then you can lead others. And so here's what I know. Today, whatever stronghold sin is in your mind and heart that's guiding or possessing or controlling you, Jesus can set you free of that. And freedom starts with confession. The Bible says, if you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and to cleanse you, purify you from unrighteousness. That means he doesn't just take the guilt of your sin away, he takes the shame away. And those who look at God's face, they can be radiant, never covered with shame because there's no sin in your life he cannot forgive. And, and you stay free by living in community. Not by living in secret, not by saying this between me and God, but by saying, I want to begin to do life with others. And Celebrate Recovery, they say, you know, you're, you're as sick as your secrets. The more you keep it to yourself, I got it under control, no one can know this, I got this. The more that stronghold continues to grow, but when you say something out loud and make yourself vulnerable and then walk with people and realize they're not judging you. They're praying for you. They're walking with you because it's their journey too. That's when the real, real freedom comes. That's when the real strongholds are breaking. The Bible says we have power to demolish strongholds. Those mindsets and those ideologies, that, that toxic thinking, those feelings that take us all over the place. And I want us to just take a moment and think about what stronghold may be gripping your heart. For some of you, like anger, that's it. I already know it. For some of you, it's, it's, it's lust, that, that grip of pornography that has so many, where people become like objects for your gratification in your private space, in your mind. And you live in this fantasy that robs you the chance to have a real relationship with a real person. And you don't, you don't know how to break it because you, you've never been able to say it out loud because the shame is so great. For some of you, it's a stronghold of inadequacy. That you're fighting, you're, you're striving so much for people's affirmation, but there's this part of you that's insatiable. No amount of compliments or you're amazing, you've done a great job, could fill that tank because the stronghold of insecurity is so strong in your life, you don't even believe it. And listen, you can sweep the house, Jesus says, and you can change your behavior, 
But if you're not filled with the spirit of God, if your house is not filled with his power and his presence, the spirit of God who whispers, you are my son, you are my daughter, the spirit who guides you in the truth, the spirit who can transform you, the spirit who can comfort and be your counselor, then changing your behavior is not gonna help because there's a spiritual string attached to every stronghold. Maybe for you, it's a sense of pride. I don't need anybody or anything. A stubborn refusal, like many of these people to say, I'm smart enough to figure this out on my own. I don't need God. And on the judgment day to find out your wisdom was not enough. Your righteousness was not enough. Maybe for you, like a lot of people, it's a spirit of fear and anxiety, a gripping, irrational fear that can paralyze you in the middle of the night or in the middle of the day and it comes out of nowhere and you're like, why, why, why is this gripping me so much? Jesus can free you from that spirit of fear. Jesus can free you and break the stronghold of, of lust and anger and adequacy and a victim mindset. He can free you from pride. He wants to do this. We all struggle with something. And if you can't think of any area of your life that needs his touch, then pride's yours. We all struggle. But we are sinners saved by grace. And we are sons and daughters who are being freed from strongholds and being brought to glory. And so we want to take a moment and make this a house of miracles. We sang this song earlier, a house of miracles. And all weekend, we've been watching people get set free from things and watch strongholds be broken and having honest conversations. And so I'm going to I'm gonna invite our prayer counselors to come out. And we're just going to line the whole front of this place. This is going to be a little different than we typically do here at Calvary. We're just going to, we're going to play some quiet music and we're going to ask if, if you're courageous enough to, to do what Gabby did and you hear the Spirit of God saying, just say it, say it out loud. And find that this is a place not just of freedom, but it's a place of safety. This is the safest place in the world to share with a prayer counselor who will pray for you. And invite the baptism of God's Spirit, the anointing of His Spirit to come over you and to give you this renewed sense of identity. And maybe for some of you who have never prayed to ask Christ in your life, maybe this is your moment. Listen, these private conversations that happen all around this room are gonna be God setting people free through the power of Jesus, his son. And for those of you who don't come forward, I'm just gonna ask you just in this moment, you can participate by just praying. There's this gift the Bible calls intercession where we pray for people to be freed. So as people come, we're not gonna ask you to clap. We're gonna ask you to pray. And you might find yourself praying for someone else and then be prompted to come up yourself. And so this next few moments, it's just gonna be quiet as we ask Jesus to do his work in his church and know that that breakthrough that happens today might be yours. Let's take that time right now. And if you're ready to come, 